If you wouldn't mind standing with me, please. We're in the Gospel of John as we're working our way through the New Testament verse by verse. John chapter 11, verse 45. John writes, Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man has worked many signs, many miracles. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. Oh no. <laughs> and the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now he did not say this on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. That would be you and me. Then, from that day on, they plotted to put Jesus to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they saw Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? Will he not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where Jesus was, he should report it, that they might seize him. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been dead and had been raised from the dead, they there made him a supper, and Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him seems to have gotten over his deadness. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance, the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscara, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept for this, this for, my, for the day, excuse me, of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but also that they might see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Let's stop there and pray. Lord, we thank you that you have recorded this historic event for us that we might study it and grow in the knowledge and wonder of you. Teach us now, we ask. Change us so that we might be different when we leave this place. We ask that in Jesus' name and all of God's children agreed by saying, Amen. Amen. You may be seated, please. <clears throat> so it, it has been a great month in fields of science another telescope out in outer space, and then uh, just in the last couple of weeks, the uh, Nobel Prize given to three physicists in an area that uh, you can just barely understand. It's so technical, and it has to do with quantum mechanics, and it's, they have an application of a strange chemical reaction that takes place and they've been able to apply it to coding messages back and forth, security, national security. So that's about as uh, easy as I can make it to understand. I could fill the blackboard with calculus, but it wouldn't help you, and I wouldn't understand it any better anyway. So very technical stuff. We're living in the time when 
Daniel said that uh, in the end times that men would run to and fro across the earth uh, when the airlines were running and, uh, and knowledge would increase. And it certainly is happening, knowledge increasing. Another area of uh, interest that fits our subject this morning in science was the discovery of uh, how COVID attacks the nasal cavity, the, uh, the various uh, suspensory cells that are inside your nasal cavity so that people lose their taste. Maybe you're some of those. An awful lot of people have lost taste and smell and uh, the virus attaches this little corona, this little tip, right onto the your olfactory process in your nose, and it bursts the cells. And that's why sometimes it takes even months to recover your taste of smell. It's kind of a great way for a, for a person to lose weight. If, <laughs> if everything tastes like cardboard, I don't know if you're one of those that have had that wonderful blessing. So we're talking about fragrance here. The fragrance that Jesus had, the Jesus fragrance. Now, it's actually a topic that John wrote into the gospel uh, back in chapter 11 when we were at the tomb of Lazarus, you'll remember. Uh, Jesus said, uh, take away the stone. And his sister, Lazarus' sister, Martha, said, Lord, he, he, he's going to smell. He stinks. You really don't want to roll that stone away, and it's not going to look pretty either. He's been in there for four days in the Mideastern sunshine. He's not going to be something you want to smell. Now, John puts that against this section that we just read about Mary pouring a very expensive perfume on Jesus that covered him from head to foot, literally. And it's a very pungent smell. And it would, in fact, remain with him. We, we suddenly entered the final week of Jesus' life. This, this dinner takes place the night before what we call Palm Sunday. So he's just a few days away from his death. And she pours this huge amount of perfume uh, all over him, or it's actually a a plant that's crushed from Nepal, and, uh, and he would carry that fragrance with him all the way through the Via Della Rosa, uh, into Pilate's chambers, into uh, the Roman courts, and, and up on to Calvary. So these two brackets, if you will, bookends about fragrance uh, surround this story that we're looking at. Now, we left uh, Lazarus alive and well after being dead for four days and uh, the Jews who had come and, and let me remind you that John when he uses the term Jews it's not a racial term for him for him he's talking about the Jewish religious leaders John himself we would call a Jew because he's of the tribe of or he's Abraham's child but he doesn't think of himself as Jew. Uh, he saw the Jews as the priests and the rabbis that were heading up the Jewish faith. So a bunch of them came to Mary and Martha's house, which was only a couple of miles from downtown Jerusalem, and uh, they were greatly impacted by what they saw. So we're uh, looking at sense. Uh, the smell, we have the three parts of this section. Uh, the smell of power, verse 45 through 57. Then the smell or the fragrance of love, 1 through 3. And the fragrance or the aroma of greed, as uh, we just read about Judas, 4 through 11. So that's where we're going. I, I think it's a fascinating part of Scripture. It's a little bit of a downer because it's leading up to Jesus' death. But ultimately... His death was a positive thing for you and for me. That's why he came. He came so that he might be sacrificed to atone for, to pay for your sins and mine. So, starting out here in verse 45, then many of the Jews, the religious leaders, who had come to Mary, been to Mary's house in Bethany, and had seen the things that Jesus did, like raise a dead guy, 
believed in him. Now, if you've been with us, that term believed or believed in the phrase repeats over and over again in the Gospel of John, 98 times. In fact, you might call it John's theme. He's really trying to get us to understand that salvation doesn't hang on performance, doing works of the law. It hangs on faith, belief, trust, same word. So he says many of these Jewish leaders who are rabbis, Uh, believed in Jesus, had accepted him as their savior. And that's the prerequisite, that's the requirement for salvation. Hebrews 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Impossible. Okay, 46. But some of them went away. Many believed, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus did. Some did not believe. How could they not believe? There was this guy dead for four days, and they stood there and watched him come out of the grave, still bound with his grave cloth. Skeptics always have a reason to disbelieve, because they rely on their own five senses. I say that with some authority, because I was one for the first 26 years of my life. I was an atheist. I didn't believe in God. And as a scientist, I said, well, you got to be able to sense it with one of your five senses. And only then, and even then you're not quite sure whether you'd believe or not. And the church, believers in Jesus Christ, are criticized quite often now in the last few years by people whose God is science who see the lab coats of a scientist as the white robe of the priest of science. Now, I am a scientist. I still am. I still have a license in California, a biochemist, but I'm trying to tell you that there's a battle going on for your mind. And they'd like to say that science has the truth, always has the truth, And the the religion is always messed up. Look what they did to Galileo. Look what they did to Leonardo da Vinci. Look what they did to various men who had new ideas. But let me tell you, scientists are just as prejudiced against God as believers are towards him. For example, 1725, they were in Australia. And the explorers from England and Australia stumbled upon a mammal, an animal, that had fur, just like many mammals do, but it had the ability to lay eggs. We know it as the duck-billed platypus. Now, it is a very unusual creature, no question about that. But when they sent the specimen back to the museum in London, the scientists there looked at it and said, it's not real. What? It's not real. In fact, on the uh, uh, London Times, they ridiculed it. The headline said that day, the hoax of the century. That's science response to new truth. They rejected it because they didn't want to believe it because they had a taxonomical system that didn't allow for fur-bearing mammals to lay eggs and have a duck bill. And worse than that, a beaver tail and fin feet. Everything's wrong with this animal. They said somebody took a mole and they stitched a duck bill on it. Literally, that's what they thought. Now, they didn't solve that in a year or two. It took a hundred years. In 1799, finally, an admiral showed up in London with a living platypus and showed it to him, and they still doubted. About 10 years later, in 1810, there was a host of them by this time, like 30 living platypuses, in the National Museum, they finally said, 
Uh, okay, it's possible for a mammal to lay eggs. Okay, and you're saying, why are you making such a big deal about this? Because it upsets me when people say to me, you're a prejudiced Christian. Well, you're a prejudiced scientist. You believe that everything just happened. Really? This body, this circulatory system, just the coagulation system, astounding, the brain, the respiratory system, God put together that. Look at your hand. It's absolutely astounding, the things it can do. I'm sorry, I'm a little excited. <laughs> God does things that science has blocked out. And, and now, all of a sudden, uh, amazing things are happening. So, uh, those who choose to disbelieve, because this is a choice. You have a choice, I have a choice. Do I believe or not in some new fact that comes? Do you believe that they gave the Nobel Prize to those three guys rightly? Who would know? A handful of 15 people that work in the field of high theoretical physics might be able to say, well, we think maybe they did something because that's how they got the prize. They put about 15 scientists together and said, you know what? We don't understand it, so it must be worth the prize. <laughs> now, this is going to go on the radio, and I'm going to get hundreds of angry scientists writing to me, but I, I just couldn't hold it back any longer. Skeptics, don't be a skeptic. If you're here today and you're an atheist or a skeptic, suspend your disbelief for the next 25 minutes. I'll be short. And we're looking at something that happened, and there's some physical proof for it. Hang in there. 47. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what shall we do for this man works many miracles, many signs? Now this is the assembly, the Sanhedrin. This is the supreme court of the Jewish council. The 70 plus the chief priests over them. And they said, what are we going to do? Because this guy is working miracles. What? They admit it? Yeah, they admit it. What can you do with a dead guy that stands up and comes to dinner? That's what's about to happen. What do we do with this guy? Because this Jesus is doing miracles. Lepers are suddenly cleansed. Guys that couldn't walk for 38 years or stand. People that couldn't see from birth suddenly can see. People that can't hear can hear and talk. What do we do with this guy? If we don't, if we just leave him alone, look at verse 48, it's awesome. If we just leave him alone, everyone will believe in him. <laughs> well, that's his point. <laughs> that's what he's looking for. He's looking for people who don't believe in him or anything supernatural to respond to him. Everyone will believe him. We've got to stop this. Why? Our own skin. The Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And, and that is actually, that many might believe in him is actually a solution as well as their problem. The solution to their problem is for Jesus to be savior for every man, woman, and child. So the Romans could come. The Romans had done it in many other nations. In fact, at this time in the first century, the Roman historian Pliny said that there were six slaves in Rome for every single citizen. A six to one ratio of slaves living in the city. Where did those slaves came from, come from? Nations that Rome had conquered. And they transported the whole population, sounds familiar, doesn't it? The population back to Rome and uh, they were forced labor. They were enslaved people. So it, it happened in 722 by the Assyrians. They took away the, the, the northern tribes. And in 586, the uh, Babylonians came and took the Jews away. They said, it's going to happen again. Because these Romans are going to say, hey, this guy's causing an uproar. 49. And one of them, Caiaphas, fasten your seatbelts, this is cool. Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Now, Josephus, the Roman historian, said he was a very arrogant man. It sounds like it, the way he 
he talks to the high council. You guys are idiots. That's what he's saying. You don't know anything at all. Verse 50, nor do you consider that it is expedient, it's good for us that one man should die for the nation. You don't see this opportunity here. Jesus is going to be killed, and it's going to keep us from being overrun by the Romans. Who is this Caiaphas? Now, this is faith-affirming archaeology for you, okay? We found Caiaphas's bones, literally. That's the bone box. His bo- now, the, the Jews would take a person who died, I won't be very graphic, they, but puts them in a in a limestone area where the material that's going to decay does, and then they put the bones in a box. Now, you can't read Hebrew, but that clearly says Caiaphas. And it's that section, the slide before, was the cave that collapsed that uh, archaeologists went into, and they were flabbergasted to find Caiaphas and his wife and his children and his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren for five generations. You can walk up to the box at the Israel Museum and touch it. You want physical proof? This is the guy that's talking. He can't talk right now. (laughs) He's in the box. (laughs) But uh, in southern Jerusalem, this cave collapsed. They went in, sent the archaeologists in, and they discovered the real box of the first century high priest. And the children, in the right order, it's him. So he says something amazing when he says, it's expedient for us that one man should die. It's technically, theologians call this substitutionary atonement. It's somebody else paying the penalty that uh, you and I deserve for our sins. And that's what he's saying. Jesus is going to be the substitutionary atonement. He's going to pay for the sins of our nation. Now, he didn't say that because he believed it. It's strange. He didn't say it in his own authority, verse 51 says, but because he was a high priest, he prophesied that Jesus would die for that whole nation. Now, this is correct. How did he say that? How did he know that? The Holy Spirit can use anybody to talk about God. We need to keep that in mind. Because you can't depend on the person's position in society or in the church or outside the church. I mean, anyone can speak truth about God. It's even possible for a politician. Rare! I know. (laughs) But it could happen. You know, we've gone through the Old Testament and there's uh, Balaam who's got... Uh, refuses to listen to God, God sends an angel, he's not listening, so he makes a donkey talk. God can speak through a donkey. He still does, today. I wonder who he's talking about. Could happen here. He didn't just say it for, he didn't just die for the nation of Israel, but he's Verse 52, not that nation only, but he would gather together children of God, not just sons and daughters of Abraham, but people whose father was God. That would be you and me from all over the world who are scattered abroad. Someday we'll all be together in the heaven in front of him. Verse 54, therefore Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to, into the country near the wilderness out in the desert to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. So this is uh, a, a city that is, uh, the name means unfruitfulness because it's right at the edge of the, de- this is Cabazon, okay? <laughs> it, it, it's right at the edge of the desert and, and nothing grows there, it's too hot. It's only about 14 miles northeast of Jerusalem. So Jesus is there. Why is he there? Is he afraid? <laughs> no, no. He's there because of timing. He's only going to be there a few days. And and that's true in your life, in my life. We're all on a schedule that God is running. And we don't know what it is. We don't know what day God's going to call us home. We don't know what day is going to be a defining moment in our life, a crossroads. Now, you can pray. God's given us that. 
But, you know, I've given God for years now really, really good advice about my life. <laughs> oh, you understand. He didn't listen to you either, huh? He just makes his own decisions. So, the reason he's there is because, verse 55, Passover of the Jews was near. And it was predicted that the Messiah would die on the Passover. I mean, that's the whole point of Passover. You remember the, it, was, it happened to the, the Egyptians, and they were trying to keep the Hebrews there, and Moses is prophesying these terrible plagues that would come. Tenth plague, there's going to be an angel that's going to come and kill all the firstborn of the nation. And, but then God tells Moses, you tell the people to sacrifice a lamb and put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and of your own home. And then that angel will pass over your house and the firstborn will live. You remember what the Egyptians did to the firstborn Jewish boys? They drowned them in the Nile River. That's why Moses was hidden in the reeds, you remember. So the same thing they were doing to the Jews, God puts that plague on them, but the blood of the lamb would protect them. Anyone's house who's under the blood of the lamb will be protected from the death angel. Still true to this day. So he's there waiting for the Passover. A lot of the Jews are already going up to Jerusalem for the feast, for the Passover feast, and they would go there uh, about six days early and they would have purification rituals, they'd fast for six days, and they'd, they'd go through a, an, a, an outdoor bath, a mikvah, and uh, all in preparation for this great high Sabbath, it was called. Verse 56, uh, then they saw Jesus, those who were at, the, uh, at Jerusalem expecting the feast, and spoke among themselves as they stood at the temple, what do you think? that he will not come to the feast. It's in the negative, like, surely he won't come. Well, the chief priests and Pharisees are thinking the same thing, verse 57. And they'd given a command that if anyone knew where Jesus was, saw him, that they should report it so that they could see, they could arrest him. Palm Sunday is at hand. It's about ready to happen. That day when Jesus sat on a donkey, comes into the city of Jerusalem, down the Mount of Olives into the Eastern Gate. So that we're right at the edge of that. That's the smell of power. Now the smell of worship, verse 1 of chapter 12. Then six days before the Passover, before this great Sabbath, Jesus came to Bethany. Now you remember Bethany is this little village on the outskirts of Jerusalem, about two miles out, where Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, and their father... Simon lived, and Jesus went there often. They came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. Now, since that time, the name of the city has been changed. We looked at it a couple of weeks ago. It's no longer Bethany. It's called El Lazarim, which is Arabic for the place of Lazarus. You see, within a matter of a few years, they no longer called it even the name of the village, Bethany, because of what happened there. A dead guy got up, and now he's sitting down for a meal. So, they start coming there. Verse 2, and they made him a supper. So it's dinner. They're thankful for raising their, their brother from the dead. So Martha, it says, verse 2, served. But Lazarus, one of those who sat at the table, he's feeling so good he's eating. <laughs> okay. Just a couple of days after he was dead, really dead. Now, you'll remember it's Mary and Martha, two sisters, and their brother is Lazarus. And uh, this is uh, the house Mark 14 says in, in Matthew 26 that it happened at Simon the leper's house in Bethany. Now, Simon used to be a leper. He wouldn't have leprosy now or nobody would be there. Okay? Early church historians tell us that Simon was healed of leprosy by Jesus. In fact, one writer said that he was the one 
leprous patient who returned of the 10 who were healed to thank Jesus. So it's to their, that's why Jesus was welcomed there. Okay, dad's been healed of leprosy. Now brother's been healed of dead. <laughs> so um, now if you're familiar with the Gospels and you read through them, you'll know that there's another event like this but not the same event in the Gospel of Luke. And I want to talk about it because I want you to see the setup for this one. Now, the one in Luke chapter 7, verse 36, happens at a man's house named Simon also, but he is called Simon the Pharisee. Bear with me just a minute because these details will help you see the whole picture. So Simon the Pharisee doesn't believe in Jesus, doesn't believe he's the Messiah, but he invites him to his house. It's in the Galilee region, that's up north. This is down, the one we're reading about here is in Jerusalem. But this first one happened in Luke chapter seven, which was the first year of Jesus' ministry. The one we're looking at in the Gospel of John is in the last year of Jesus' ministry, two years, three years later than the first one. But let me tell you about the first one. So Simon's has Jesus there. He's there at a table, and there it's called a triclinium. It's a short table. It's like maybe a foot high, and um, you would have a pillow that you would rest if you're right-handed, your elbow on, and you would eat food, and you wouldn't have to, if it was pizza, you could just shovel it in. It'd be great for eating pizza. Then. Okay, so this table causes no room under the table for your feet, for your knees, so you have to lay out with your feet up here. That's important because they're having dinner and they're eating away. Jesus is there. And a woman comes in to Simon the Pharisee's house and she's evidently not invited. And she walks in and she walks over to Jesus, which would be over here with his feet out, barefooted, sandals at the door, still happens in Israel. And he's got his feet out and he's no doubt talking. She walks around here and she leans over him and she starts to cry. She starts to weep so much that the tears are coming down her face onto his feet. And awkward moment, she gets down, takes off her hair, barrette or whatever it was, covering, takes her hair and wipes off his feet and then puts an oil, a perfume on his feet and Mark tells us on his head also. Now, Simon is sitting there with his arms crossed and he looks at this whole thing going on. He says, well, this guy obviously isn't the Messiah because if he was, he'd know that that woman was of ill repute. She was a prostitute. And he wouldn't be allowing her to touch him. So Jesus reads his mind. He didn't say that out loud. Jesus read his mind and said, Simon, I have a question. And Simon says, well, of course. He said, there was a man that was owed money from two men. One of them owned owed him 10 grand, $10,000. The other owed him 100. Neither one of them could pay the man. So when they came and begged, the man forgave them both. Who do you suppose, Simon, appreciated the forgiveness more? Who loved the man more? Simon thought a moment. He said, well, I suppose it would be the man who was forgiven the $10,000. And Jesus said, Simon, you judge rightly. When I came into your house, you did not wash my feet, which was a normal thing to happen in the first century in Israel. But this woman came in and she washed my feet with her tears and dried it with her hair. When I came, you did not anoint my head with oil. That was a very common, expected thing to happen when you had hospitality, when you invited somebody over. What was that about? Well, 
no deodorant in those days, and the oil was always laced with some spice, okay? Uh, usually an inexpensive one. He said, but you didn't put any anointing on my head. She has anointed, according to Mark, she poured it over his head and all over his body. And then he told the parable. He said, uh, she who has been forgiven much loves much. And there's a picture of the heart of God concerning worship. Now, fast forward to John chapter 12. Those of you that are still awake, the same sort of situation happens, but it's not Simon the Pharisee, it's Simon the leper who'd been healed. It's not a prostitute. This is Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, and they're together uh, giving this dinner for Jesus. So, verse 3, Mary took a pound of a very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet. And again, Mark tells us that she put it all over his hair, too. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Now, spikenard, or nard as, as it's called in Nepal, uh, that's a shot of Everest, Nepal uh, lowlands in the foreground there. This particular flowering plant grows there naturally. It is a, one of the strongest um, bases for perfume in the world. It's even stronger than rose oil, which knock your head off when you smell it pure. That's the root and the first part of the stem that in that day, if you're old enough, you remember pharmacists had mortar and pistols where they would grind up a, a certain, that was when pharmacists still made chemicals, now they just count them. And uh, I'm teasing, there's a pharmacist here this morning. And, and so they would grind it up, make a little powder, and then put some palm oil, just a little bit so it'd have some texture. And then they would put it in an alabaster box. Alabaster is a soft stone you find all over the Middle East. It's so soft you can put it on a lathe and turn it down. And so there's these cruises or little boxes that they put the oil and they seal it with wax all the way around and that becomes a dowry for a woman. In other words, she saves up her money, she's hoping to be married someday, this will pay for her wedding and the house that she's going to have. So she puts it on the feet of Jesus, as I said, Mark 14, 3 says also this head, and she sensed that Jesus was about to die. And his person was covered with this very strong, I mean, they put a little dot on it and put it on the forehead behind the ear or something. She poured the whole thing on him. It, it's an ounce. Now, the Roman ounce was, or pound was one, it took 12 of our ounces to make a pound. So say 12 ounces of perfume. Now, you guys that have tried to buy perfume for your wife, I remember one time trying to buy some perfume for Ray Lynn, and I saw an ad somewhere. And so I went and asked for it, and she said, sure, uh, how big a bottle do you want? I said, I don't know, what's a normal size bottle? She points that one. I said, what's that cost? She said, $450. She said, I, don't misunderstand, I really, really, really love my wife. But 450 bucks for a half ounce? of this perfume. I won't use the perfume number. So that's the feeling here, okay? This is some, uh, if you use the figures Judas is going to say in a minute in chapter uh, 12, verse 5, 300 denarii, a denaria is a day's wages. So you mul multiply that by 300 days, that's really a year. So what do you make a year? Uh, even uh, shift managers that Del Taco make 18 bucks an hour now, so, uh, so the sign says anyway. And so we're talking about thirty to $40,000 worth of, oh, what's she doing with all that? She's been saving, and she saves it. She, 
She's created a stink, okay? That's the easy way of saying that. She didn't hold back anything. It's a picture of worship. What? This is a picture in the New Testament of what it means to worship God. Now, I, we worshiped earlier. I, I pray that you joined in as we were singing because that's what the book of Hebrews says we are to do now. We are to offer a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, and that's the sacrifice that God accepts as worship. Speaking or singing truth, worth Shup, the worth of God to us. <coughs> Excuse me. So worship always costs the worshiper something. Not, not financially always, but it costs you. If you were worshiping this morning, you came in and you had to sing. Well, I don't feel like singing at nine o'clock in the morning. Listen, nobody does, okay? <laughs> but that's why you give it. You force yourself to speak to God, sing to God of who he is, how important he is to you. That's worship. The Greek word is proskeniskou. It means to get down on, we don't do that here, but you get down on your face and you worship towards God with your hands. To kiss towards, literally it says in the Greek language. This woman took all that she had and she poured it on Jesus. What's the outcome of that? For the next week, every place Jesus went, it would knock people down with how strong this spike nard, this nard was impacting them. When Jesus went down the Via della Rosa carrying the cross, everyone went, the fragrance is beautiful. The Jesus fragrance. When he went into Pilate's court, it filled the whole courtroom with this spikenard odor, this fragrance. At the cross, when the centurion leaned over him as they were putting the nails in, he went, wow, it's that smell. That smell is Jesus. It's the fragrance of Jesus. Verse 6. So he complains, why didn't we sell it for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He's talking about poor Judas, okay? Verse 6. This he said not because he cared for the poor. He didn't care at all about the poor. But he was a thief. The word is klepto in the Greek language where we get kleptomaniac. So he was a compulsive thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put into it that was given to Jesus. Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. A little insight into worship. Everybody else heard that Jesus said, I'll have to be, the son of man will have to be lifted up as Moses lifted up the snake in the middle of the tribe of Israel. And then I must go and die in Jerusalem. And over and over again, Jesus said, I think she's the only one that heard it. The day of his burial. And she knew it was coming. Jesus said, verse 8, the poor you have with us, you always, but you don't have me always. It's actually Deuteronomy 15. It's an Old Testament verse that he's quoting. 9, then a great many of the Jews knew that he was there at Mary and Martha's house. And they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. I, I love this. I think this is funny. So uh, how do they get in the house? They're not very big houses there. And so we got 12 apostles. We got some disciples. We got Mary, Martha, Lazarus, their dad. Uh, some Jew, Jewish leadership that are there. So I think there's a whole bunch of people outside looking in the window of them eating dinner. And what do you think the conversation was like? Hey, is that Lazarus? Yeah. He looks pretty good. Well, for a dead man, in fact, I don't think he's ever looked better. He looks real rested. <laughs> 
Or maybe they're asking him questions. Hey, Lazarus, did you see the throne? (laughs) What do angels really look like? What was the tree of life like? How about the river in, this, in, in, hot, in paradise? How was all that? We don't know what they were saying. But you know, maybe they said, wow, he, he looks really good. Maybe I could go through death and come out better. You will, okay? Ten, chief priests took counsel that they might also put Lazarus to death. Come on. The guy just got out of a grave. He'd been dead for four days. You want to kill him again? Why? He was a walking, talking miracle. What do you do with the guy that everybody said, don't roll away the stone, he stinks. And he did. And suddenly he's alive. Verse 11. Because and on account of him, many of the Jews, the religious leaders, went away and believed in Jesus. Believed in. So, ask you a question. What did Lazarus do to be raised and become this great witness? Did he deserve it? He did nothing. It was the grace of Jesus. How do you get into heaven? How do I get into heaven? The grace of God. You can't earn it. Well, don't I have to go to a certain kind of church? No. Well, don't I have to give money to the church? No. Don't I have to, like, help people? You know, across the street or something? No. When you believe, God will change you and he'll change your fragrance. What? He's going to change your smell. Some of you are saying, thank God. No. I'm talking about Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2.14. Now thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one... We are the aroma of death to death, but to the other, the aroma of life to life. So you are to bring the aroma, the fragrance of Christ to the world around you, people at work, the neighbor across the street. You're in a classroom at a university, to that classroom. You are to diffuse the aroma of Jesus every place you go. Okay, let me try and pull it all together. We'll close with this. Uh, years ago, Raiden and I worked in the Soviet Union and um, smuggling Bibles and some crazy stuff like that. And um, I heard this story when we were there. It's an ancient story, pre-Soviet story about Russia. A nobleman who was very wealthy lived in Kiev. They called it Kiev in those days. Today, the Ukrainians call it Kiev. But he was living there, and he needed to make a trip to St. Petersburg, which is uh, hundreds of miles in the dead of winter. Very dangerous. And uh, so he went with his servant, and they walked. And when they didn't show up a week later, the friends of the noblemen from St. Petersburg went south looking for their friend. And they found him in the snow, face down, frozen stiff, dead as a doornail. And so when they finally picked him up, he was literally frozen stiff, and they turned him over. Underneath him was his servant, who was face up, quaking, he was so cold, but alive. And they pulled him out, and they warmed him up, and they said, what happened? He said, well, we got trapped in this snowstorm, and and I fell down, and my master said, lay still, face up. And he laid on top of me, and he said, don't move. You have to stay there. You'll die if you don't move. Stay under me. 
the master died, froze to death in that position. He said, I heard him take his last breath and he died. And they pulled him off and he said, my master died for me. That's true about every person in this place. Your master, Jesus, died for you. Would you stand, please? And we'll pray together. Thank you, Lord, that your love is displayed in so many ways. And we are are just embarrassed by your grace towards us. We worship you, Lord, for that. We thank you for your presence here. Speak, we ask, Lord, to those who need to surrender to you. Christians, please pray. So I wonder if there's someone here this morning, maybe someone brought you, a wife or friend, and, uh, and you have never surrendered your life to God. Or maybe you had at one time and you're gone down a different road, you're far from it. And God is speaking to you about you surrendering your life here this morning. Now we wouldn't do anything to embarrass you, we just want to give you an opportunity to do that to confess Jesus before men and women. If you'd like to know that your sins are forgiven, if you'd like to know that you're going to spend eternity with your Heavenly Father, if you're ready to surrender your life to God, would you let me know you're ready by looking up at me and raising your hand? God bless you, and you, and you, sir, young lady behind you, couple behind the sound booth. God bless you on the aisle here. God bless you. Yes, and you, sir, in the back. Couple, yeah, God bless you. If I missed your hand, don't worry. God didn't. He's the one that needs to see it. Those of you that raised your hands, would you please say a prayer with us out loud? We'll all do it together to make it easy for you. So we're going to ask him to forgive our sins, and he's going to do that right where you're standing. Everybody, please say, Lord Jesus... I surrender. I give you my life. 